Are we live? Is this live? Okay, I hope this is live. Okay, why Guru Ji ka Khalsa, why Guru Ji ki Fateh. I'm just gonna do Mool Mantra for a bit so that everybody can come on and then we'll start. Ik Om Kar Sat Naam Karta Purkh Nirpao Nirvair Akal Murat Ajuni Sepangur Prasade Jap Aade Satch Jugade Satch Happy Satch Nanak Hussi Pi Satch Ik Om Kar Sat Naam Karta Purkh Nirpao Nirvair Akal Murate Ajuni Sepangur Prasade Jap Aade Satch Jugade Satch Happy Satch Nanak Hussi Pi Satch Ik Om Kar Sat Naam Karta Purkh Nirpao Nirvair Akal Murat Ajuni Saipangur Prasade Jap Aade Satch Jugade Satch Happy Satch Nanak Hussi Pi Satch Ik Om Kar Sat Naam Karta Purkh Nirpao Nirvair Akal Murate Hajuni Saipang Which I'm sure everywhere else everyone is talking about. But today I thought I would share with all of you um, some of the things that I find very inspirational, a few sakis that I find very inspirational, um, especially when we're at home and uh, we have an opportunity to uh, further our spiritual process. So today I'm going to majorly talk about three sakya of women that are related to Sikhi via the Pagats. And their sakis have been very inspirational to me. And so I hope that you guys can um, gain some inspiration from them as well. One thing I have to say off the bat that this is very strange because I'm used to talking to faces and there's nobody in my room. So I guess this is what YouTubers feel like. But um, let me just check if this is actually even working. Is this working? Like, can, can someone comment and tell me that this is actually working and you can hear me and you see me? Well, I'm going to assume that it's working. So let's start with the first uh, Saki. So I'm going to talk about three females. One's name is Jenna. The second one you may have heard of, her name is uh, Mira, Mira Bai. And the third one I'm going to talk about is Jhalam Bai. So these are probably names of women that you probably haven't heard before. They're very popular in India, but they're not really that popular. Um, oh, someone says that I keep freezing. I don't know what to do about that because I'm on the best internet connection here. Anyways, let's just continue on with this. So the first one is Asaki of Jenna. And the reason I want to bring the Asaki up is a lot of the times as a female prachatic, I get asked the question, do females also get enlightened? Can females also be gurus? Can females also become saints? There aren't very many examples of them. So is it even possible? And I like to give them a few examples that I'm going to share with you today that, yes, it's absolutely possible. But in history, the female journey hasn't really been recorded loudly. It's kind of been a little bit more docile and kind of kept to the back, maybe because of the culture, you know, during those times. But there are a few gems that I would like to share with you today. Before we start off, I just wanted to put one pointer out there about what a guru does, because it'll be important to the sakhis that I tell you today. The guru-shish relationship is not something unique 
to the Sikh Sampada. In fact, the Guru-Shish relationship has been around ever since the beginning of time. The Guru-Shish relationship has been around, it's, it's in the Buddhist philosophy, it's in Sanatan philosophy, it's in Christian philosophy, but they just give it different names. It's the most logical way to go about enlightenment. Now, the Guru-Shish relationship has become such a, it's the, one of the most divine relationships that there is out there. And there's so much that encompasses it, but I'm going to try to simplify it and just break it down to two things that are necessary for the Guru to give to the disciple. One thing is, two things. One thing is that the Guru always imparts some kind of meditative procedure. We call this Nam, we call this Jugati, we call this um, Avidhi, some kind of meditative procedure that the Guru, the Pura Satguru themselves has done and it works 100% verified for Mukti, for the final enlightenment, it works. The second thing that a Guru does is they give you Brahm Uptesh, or the knowledge of the absolute truth. So we call that uh, Shabad. We call that Satya Updesh, Sat Updesh, or Brahm Updesh, many different ways to explain it. But two specific things that a Pura Satguru must do in order for them to transfer enlightenment to their disciple. One is some kind of meditation, meditative procedure. And the second one is knowledge of the absolute truth. So I just want to keep I just want you guys to keep this at the back of your head while I go through these sakis. Now, starting off with Jana Bai. Jana was, I would say, less than 10 years old when her mother died. She was a little girl. She was from a uh, she was from a poor family and low caste. And her mother died. Her father was so upset that her mother had died that he actually ended up leaving Jana at like a mandir. And he just left her there. Jenna, having nobody around, she's orphaned now uh, because she doesn't know if her father's alive anymore either. She stays at this mandir and day and night she's saying bittal, bittal, bittal. So the word bittal for Vaheguru appears in Guru Granth Sahib Ji as well, but Jenna all day is saying bittal, bittal because she has nowhere else to go. A family comes to that mandir and they see that there's a young girl here. She doesn't have a family. Why don't we take her home and give her a job to do? So this family takes Jenna home and um, they tell Jenna that if you work, you know, you do some chores around the house, we'll give you food and we'll give you a place to stay. And Jenna agrees because she, she needs to eat. She needs a place to live. So she agrees to living with this family. As she's doing her chores, she asks the family, can I have at least one hour that I go to the mandir every morning? And the family says, of course, you can go to the mandir one hour as long as you do all of the house duties that you're supposed to do. And so Jenna spends one hour in the morning going to the mandir and she's cleaning outside, she's doing seva, and all she says is bittal, 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 bittal. And then she asks her family, can I go one hour in the evening as well? And they say, as long as you do your chores at the house, you can go to the mandir in the evening as well. So she spends every single day, one hour in the morning, one hour in the evening, just doing seva at the mandir. And she says, bittal, 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 all the time. What ends up happening is this family has a child. And they tell Jenna, Jenna, it's going to be your responsibility to take care of this child. Um, you have to become his nanny, take care of how he eats. And she asks, I'll take care of him, but can I take him to the mandir as well? And they say, absolutely, you can take him to the mandir, but just it's your responsibility to take care of this child. So she has a small child that she's responsible to take care of. And she carries him around to this mandir morning and evening. And all she ever says is bittal, 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 bittal. And this child, see, a lot of people ask me, a lot of mothers ask me, how do we make sure that our children get into Sikhi? And I say, it's not enough that only your words are saying, get into Sikhi, get in, into Sikhi. A child, especially a small child, reacts a lot more 
to the general aura of the person, to the general being of the person. And right now, Jana is completely entrenched in her bhakti. So this child is not only gaining off of, is not just hearing things from her, but is actually sensing things from her. Jana's bhakti is quite literally being transferred onto the small child. So um, Jana, uh, sorry, Jana Bai, she's all she's saying, she asks the family, can I have two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening? And eventually she increases a lot of the time so that she's at the mandir all the time because she only has one job now to take care of the child. And the child is always with her and she's always saying, bittal, 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 bittal. Child grows up with her. And what happens one day is uh, at the mandir, so if you go to a mandir, they have murtiya and they um, decorate their murtiya with a lot of expensive jewels and decorations and flowers. And one of the necklaces, which is very expensive, gets stolen. And when it gets stolen, whoever did the stealing, whether it was the committee or somebody, they think it's best to blame Jenna because she is the one that's always at the mandir. So she must, they don't think that Jenna has been there for so long and the necklace has never been stolen. All they're thinking is we need somebody to blame and she doesn't have a family. Plus she's low class or low caste. So there isn't going to be much, you know, say back. Let's blame her. Jenna says over and over again that I didn't steal the necklace. But no one listens to Jenna. So in that time, if you steal, you know, something from a murti, um, you pretty much get capital punishment in front of the entire village, basically. And the entire village gathers around and they're going to hang Jenna. They start off with the rope, so the Saki goes that they start off with a rope and they tie a rope around her neck. And when they, uh, when they take the chair out from beneath her so that she'll get hanged, the rope sort of withers away. And, um, but you know, the, the, the village people think, uh, you know, maybe it was just a faulty rope. It was a bad rope. It broke. So they bring in a chain, like a metal chain. They check it. They make sure that it's not weak anywhere. And they put the chain around. And they're about to, uh, they take the chair out from beneath her. And the chain just completely melts away like water. And she doesn't get hanged. And everybody there is now watching that there's some kind of divine intervention happening here. We did something wrong because how is it possible for a metal chain to just melt away like that? And so all of them, they start to, you know, put their head down and, say, we're very sorry, Jenna. But at this point, Jenna has made up her mind that nobody in this world is mine except for Bittal. Only Bittal is mine, and she leaves for the mountains. We'll get to that at the very end. But the only one that ever comes to the savior of the really drenched devotees that we call Pagats, is the one that they do Bhakti of, Vaheguru. And so Bittal came to her rescue. But at this point, she left. And what that meant was she also left the child behind. That child would always, where is Jana? Where is Jana? How can I find her? Bittal, Bittal, he's crying because he's looking for that connection again. And he can't find it because Jana has left. That same child, grew on to become Bhagat Nam Dev Ji. And Bhagat Nam Dev Ji's Bani, of course, appears in Guru Granth Sahib Ji oh, quite a lot. And we bow down to Bhagat Nam Dev Ji's Bani. And that same child became Bhagat Nam Dev Ji. Now, if you read Bhagat Nam Dev Ji's Bani, you'll recognize that one of the mantras or Nam that Bhagat Nam Dev Ji uses a lot in their Bani is called Bittal. So there's a Shabad called... Um, uh, Shabad by Iba Beetal Uba Beetal Beetal bin Sansad Nahi. And the entire Shabad goes on about how Bhagat Nam Devji does Bhakti of Vaheguru. But they use the word Beetal. And the reason I mention this is because remember how I said that a Pura Guru gives you two things. One is some kind of meditative procedure. And number two is 
knowledge of absolute truth. Now, Jenna had left before she could even, before the child could talk. But Jenna had given Bhagat Nam Dev Ji the meditative procedure, the Nam, the Vidhi. And it was this that Bhagat Nam Dev Ji continued with Bittal, 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 Bittal. That's how they um, did their Bhakti. As um, one, one little point I want to make here is this comes to show you how important satsangat is, how important your sangat is. Everybody knows about Prahlad, Bhagat Prahlad Ji. Um, Bhagat Prahlad Ji was born to a very devilish family, if you want to call it that. Uh, the, what we sing every single day in Rara Sahib, Har Jug Jug Bhagat Upaya, Paj Rakhda Aya, Ram Raje, Har Nakas Dust Har Marya, Prahlad Taraya. Right? Now, if you think about it, how is a Pagat like Prahlad, who Marat says, Nam Japyo Ji Aise Aise, through Prahlad Japyo Har Jaise, how did a Pagat like Prahlad take birth in a family like Harnakshas? And Harnaksh was known as a sort of a, a devil, if you want to call it that. Very bad person. So how does it happen? But if you read Prahlad's history, Prahlad's mother, while Prahlad was in the womb, actually spent time with Narad Muni. So Narad Muni is one of the great saints uh, of the Bhakti movement. And she spent time at Narad's ashram while she was uh, she had Prahlad in the womb. So all while she uh, while Prahlad was in the womb, all he heard was satsangat. And when Prahlad was born, they actually stayed in Narad's ashram as well. And Narad Muniji was actually um, who gave Prahlad the mantra and was Prahlad's guru. But I just wanted to make this uh, point that satsangat is so important. It can completely change the course of your life. Now, we're very aware of physical sangat. And I, I have to say something um, that we often see or hear. The sangat just doesn't just mean that the person is wearing a bana or that, you know, they look like a Sikh. Sangat means a lot more than that. It means, what does this person talk about? When I'm with them, do I feel judgment? Do I feel like contemplating reality? Do I feel like connecting with Guru Granth Sahib Ji? Does a Shabbat, do I feel like wanting to understand Shabbat? Do I feel like wanting, do I want to be with this person? There's a lot of other factors that go into what, really denotes such sangat. So it's not just based on looks. Sometimes your best sangat might be somebody who's not even a sick. But when you sit with them, when you talk to them, all you want to contemplate is what the heck is real? What the heck is false? The shabads that Guru Teg Bahadur Sahib Ji talks about all the time. For example, Jo supana ar pekna taise jab ko jaan in mein kach saacho nahi nanik bin bhagwan. So all of these does it make you contemplative? Do you want to be with this person? Does being with this person make you more gentle? We always talk about prem bhakti and how your man needs to become shuddh and how your man needs to become more gentle and more kind. But do the people that you surround yourself with, do they make your mind, do they make your being more gentle? So these are a few things. The second point I wanted to make was we're very aware of our physical sangat, but not, we're not very aware of our virtual sangat, which is actually what we do a lot more sangat of, especially when you're at home under quarantine. Um, what you see online, what you hear online, what you hear on WhatsApp, any social media is so important. News is largely negative. The shows that you watch on Netflix, some of them are largely negative. The people that you hear, the music that you hear, is it's it's very negative in tone. And so when you're doing sangat of that all the time, you become very negative in tone. You become very judgmental. You also take on the anxieties and the depressions and the sort of the negativity of the world. So be careful who you're doing virtual sangat of as well, because you know that's kind of new in this age. And so a lot of, um, we're not really sure how to navigate that properly. Anyways, back on to uh, Janabai. So Bhagat Nam Dev Ji 
has this impression of Jana on, on him. And so he says, Bittal, Bittal, Bittal. As Bhagat Nam Devji goes on their spiritual journey, which was largely started off by Jana, because now he's searching, where do I get that high? Where do I get that anand that I used to get with Jana? And he goes on to uh, meeting their guru, whose name was Guru Gyaneshwar. Guru, uh, guru Gyaneshwari Ji. Bhagat Nam Devji and Gyaneshwari Ji were from the Maharashtrian region in India. And um, the reason I actually mention Guru uh, Ganeshwari Ji is because Ganeshwari Ji was another um, enlightened saint in the Bhakti movement. And their siblings, they, I think they had two brothers and one sister, were also enlightened. And I, one of, their sister's name was Muktabai. And the reason I want to bring up Muktabai is because her sakhi is very interesting. Um, so Muktabai was a very accomplished saint. Um, what I mean by that is she was enlightened, but she also had, you know, powers and things like that. So now when it comes, when we talk about powers, even today, scientists, um, a lot of declassified information, a lot of new um, experiments are now coming to the forefront that show that there is, there is possibility within the human body to do things that are beyond just the five senses and things like that. So anyways, Back in Muktabai's time, there was a, a person named Jangdev who used to do a lot of meditation, a lot of dhyan. But the thing is, just because you do a lot of dhyan and meditation, it doesn't mean you're doing it for the right reasons. His, you know, he wanted a lot of powers. He wanted attention. He wanted to be, you know, one of the cool guys of, of the time. And so Jangdev was very accomplished. He was an accomplished yogi, but he wasn't enlightened. He was just, he had a lot of cool tricks up his sleeve, if you want to call it that. And he keeps hearing about Muktabai. Like, Muktabai is this, Muktabai is this. He's like, who is this Muktabai? She's, seen, she's a girl, and there's no way somebody is more powerful than me. And so what he does is he's sitting on top of a tree. The story goes like this. He's sitting on top of a tree, and he, like, orders the tree to lift off the ground and, like, fly towards Muktabai. Now, Muktabai senses that Jangdev is coming. And so what she does, what she's doing at that time is, do you guys know what Patya are? Um, basically in India, instead of using firewood for fire, they use cow manure and they make it into little pies. And so she was actually making these cow manure pies because she was, they come, uh, Ganeshwari ji and Muktabai and their siblings, they came from, I think a low class, a low caste, so they weren't very rich. So she's just making these cow pies and she senses that Jangdev was about to come. And so what she does is she's sitting on top of her little hut and she orders the, the roof of the hut to come off the ground and start flying towards Jangdev. And so then when Jangdev and Muktabai have their face off, Jangdev thinks, you know, the tree is alive. So the fact that I can order it, you know, it makes sense to me, but how are you ordering an inanimate object like the roof? into the sky, meaning John Dave's ego, that he was the best guy, the, the most powerful dude around, was completely squandered. And what Muktabai says to him after this is really, really amazing. She says, John Dave, what you and I are doing, this is not that special. Look at the birds, even they can fly. So just because we can fly things doesn't make us any, doesn't make us special. And she says to John Dave, that up until now, you've done so much tap, so you've done so much meditation, so much dhyan, so much mantra job, but for what? Only to increase and fortify your ego? Jangdev, you need to go back and you need to do sadhana this time, but this time your spiritual process should be to merge with Vaheguru, to understand who you actually are for self-realization. And so a large, Jangdev's entire life sort of switches gears and it was largely in part due to Muktabai. So one of the other things that a guru does is they steal our hankar, right? There's four elements to our mind, to our composition, if you want to call it that. The, the man, buddh, chit, and hankar. The hankara element is the most deep rooted and the most difficult to get rid of because it's the first element in our identification as a, as a jeev. And Oh, thank you, Harijot. 
He just says that he loves these stories. So what happens is that hankara element, I, a person themselves cannot get rid of their own hankar because how are you going to get rid of it? Because you have to have hankar as a jeev to get rid of hankar. There's an illogical statement there. Unfortunately, today's presentation is not that long. But anyways, one of the other um, things that a, a guru does is they steal somebody's hankar. And Muktabai, in large part, stole away all of Jangdev's ego about being this really strong and powerful yogi and completely changed the course of his life so that now when he went back and did his meditations, his tap and his mantra job and his simran, he did it because this time he wanted to meet Vahiguru. You know, they always say there's there's a world beyond the stars. There's a world beyond the shine and, and the glossiness. There's something else to be gained. And this is similar to what Guru Nanak Dev Ji said to the, the siddhas that they would meet at, um, at, uh, in the mountains. Some of the siddhas were enlightened. So Guru Nanak Dev Ji wasn't really referencing them, but some of those siddhas, they were very powerful. They had a lot of tap and a lot of dhyan, but they weren't enlightened yet. They hadn't gone, they hadn't, ultimately merged with Wahiguru. And so they largely would say to these Siddhas as well, that there's something more to be gained. You're stuck here, right? So that's what Muktabai did to Jangdev. And um, so that is the story of Janabai in large part. And how she, that's very inspiring to me to know that a woman could be this influential in, in the life of a Bhagat that is so popular in the, not only in the Sikh uh, Samparada, but pretty much all in all of India. The second story though is like Mirabai. I'm sure maybe some of you guys have heard of her, some of you haven't. I have to say as a female Pajarik, but also as a, a, a female seeker, there is nobody that is more inspiring to me than Mira is. Her story is just phenomenal, okay. So Mirabai was a Rajput princess. She is from royalty. She's a Rajput princess. And her entire life revolves around Krishanji. She's a Bhagat of Krishanji's. Every, from a small age, she would take Krishanji's murti, hug it, sleep with it, talk to it, to the point that when she got married, her husband accused her of cheating with him because she would sit inside this room and talk to someone. And then when he would open the door, she would be talking to Krishan, 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 laughing, dancing, just in front of the murti. She was so devout in her bhakti to Krishanji. And what ends up happening, a lot of people ask me, how do we know that we're doing bhakti properly? How do we know that our bhakti is actually working? What's supposed to happen to us? One of the things that happens in bhakti, when bhakti starts to give fruit, one is that your man becomes very gentle, but your man also takes on a very transparent quality, a very translucent quality. And what I mean by that is your man starts to go through the world and stops getting attached something happens it happened let it go something bad happens something good happens it kind of just slithers right off instead of sticking that's a translucent quality of the mind but as a result of that the mind becomes very contemplative and the two words that i'm really referencing here if some of you have caught my drift are vivek and bedak if you want to say it with a b Bibek and Berag. These two things, Bibek Buddhi, which shows up in Gurbani so much, Har Pareo, Swami Kya Dwara, Dije Buddha Bibeka. I mean, Bibek Buddhi is talked about by all the Pagats, by all the, all the Guru Sahibans quite a bit. Berag is talked about quite a bit. But Vivek and Berag, these two things happen to you naturally, not forced, naturally when bhakti starts to give fruit. Mira's bhakti to Krishanji, when it started to give fruit, when it started to ripen, this is what has started happening to her. 
She's a Rajput princess. There is nothing. There are servants at her command. There's nothing that she doesn't have. But none of it starts to matter to her. All she ever thinks about is what the heck is real in this world? It's just leading to the contemplation of reality. Nothing matters, not the clothes, not the people that you're with, not the statuses, not your body, not anything related to the body, not your gender, nothing matters except understanding what the heck is real. And what I mean by this is, for example, a lot of people ask me, how do we increase our Vivek? How do we increase our Virag? Here's a few exercises that you can do. Okay, maybe you shouldn't do this because my mom got kind of mad when I did this. I used to go to my mom and I used to ask her this question. I said, mom, do you know who your children were in your last life? And my mom you know, she says, no, I don't remember who my children were in, in my previous life. And I asked her, I said, well, if you don't remember your children from your last life, then you're not going to remember me in your next life. And then she just stares at me like, that totally makes sense, but I don't want to think about this right now. And I continue, continuously contemplate this. Every single person that you know right now is not going to remember you. In a few thousand days, by the way, depending on how, how old you are, all you got to do is 365 times however many years you think you're going to live. So if you live in like the US or Canada, you know, average lifespan is 80. So whatever your age is, 80 minus your age multiplied by 365. You get a couple thousand, a number that's in the thousands. After a couple thousand days, which is not that much, imagine, like, let's say you have 10,000 days left. If you put a dollar in every single day, you still can't afford a good car. That's how I think about it. It's so little. If you put <laughs> in just a couple thousand days, every single person that you know is not going to remember you. And you're not going to remember them in your, in your next life. This is a way to think about Vivek. This is how Vivek starts to come into your life. All of a sudden, you know, I love my mother. I love my father. But I don't even remember who my parents were in my last life. Then how am I going to remember them in my next life? And you do this to every single person that you know. Then you calculate how long your life is. It's not very long. I don't have very many days left. This life is short. Then you start to contemplate what the heck is real in this world. Because I'm going to get a little bit more sciency on you. So if you guys enjoy the sciency aspect of it, here's something for you. Have you ever experienced this world outside of your five senses? Have you ever experienced this world without using your eyes, without using your taste buds, without using your nose? without using any of your touch receptors, without using your ears? Have you, have you ever experienced this world outside of your five senses? The answer is no. If I wanna know what's behind me, I have to turn around and I have to look at it or I have to feel it or I have to hear it, right? We have not experienced this world outside of the five senses and now scientists, you know, there's so much research out there that says our senses are not that great. Our animals have better sensibilities than we do. If everything I know about this world is through these five senses, then what is the world even real? And this is where contemplations like Jo Supana Arpekna, Tese Jag Gojan. In Mekach Satjo Nehi Nanaka Bin Pagwan, think of this entire world like a dream. Actually, actually. Um, Guru Teg Bahadur Sahibji doesn't say like a dream, it is a dream. This entire world is a dream. Or our gurus continuously say, this entire world is a game. It's a play. Kel, kel, a kel, kel, an antako pir ek. That comes in Jap Sahib. Or the way that Guru um, Gobind Singh Ji describes their coming. Dekhna ayo jagat tamasha. They're referencing this entire thing as a game, as a play, as a dream, which means it's not inherently real. These types of contemplations start to overtake you when you start to realize that uh, when, when Bhakti starts to give fruit. So this is what's happening in Mira's life. And she's, it's this type of contemplation really, it's called 
tiver vivek and tiver virag. This type of contemplation drives a person nuts when it starts to happen. And she goes to uh, Benares and she starts, she hears Bhagat Ravidasti talking about reality, what's real, what's not. And all she can do, she is resolute. She goes and does dandot to Bhagat Ravidasti, like it comes in Kirtan Sohila. Kar sadhu anjali punvardahe, kar dandot punvardahe rahau. She goes and she surrenders herself to Bhagat Ravidasji. And not only that, Bhagat Ravidasji takes her on as a female disciple. And I just want to really sort of push this in. This is revolutionary. How many other examples do you know of a male guru taking on a female disciple. And this is happening in a day and age that is like, you think today is, is you know, females don't have enough, uh, they don't have equality, they don't have all of that. Even today we're dealing with that type of environment. Can you imagine how much worse it was like several centuries ago? when everybody thought backwards, especially for a Rajput princess to go and surrender to a male guru who's a Jamar. Jamar are very low caste. Um, it's considered a low caste and Rajputs are considered high caste. But Mira is so resolute in her surrender. And I would say Bhagat Ravidasji is right up there because to take on a female, it, it requires a lot of revolution. Um, so the courage and revolution and the resolute of surrender is there from Mira's part. And what happens is when Mira returns to um, Rajasthan, which is where she lives originally, her entire family wants to kick her out wants to torture her. Why? Because they say, Mira, it's fine that you don't want to have children with your husband. It's fine that your husband died and you didn't even have children. It's fine that you spend all day in a room locked up talking to Krishnji's murti. But if you really wanted to surrender to a guru, why the heck didn't you pick a Brahmin one? There are so many in Banaras. Why did you have to go and surrender to a Chamar? You're dishonoring us in society. You've completely brought us to the lowest. And they tortured her. They tried to, Mira, they tried to poison her with like actual poison. They tried to poison her using a snake, uh, a, a venomous snake. They tried to, one of the other things they did to Mira was in Rajasthan, because it's a lot of it is desert. They tied her hands up and then tied that to the back of a camel and then made the camel run in the desert. Her entire skin was peeling off. The amount of struggle and strife that Mira had to go through, that part is what just keeps me going. Because when I see her resoluteness, her, uh, like she will not back away. She will not back off. She's in it completely. And she's gonna go all the way to the end. Her tiag, her forbearance is so strong and that gives me so much inspiration that I know a lot of people think today's times are different, but I'm a female Pajatic on the groundwork. I'll tell you, there's a lot of work that needs to be done out there. And I don't want to say specific examples, but even today females are discriminated against in the religious world and in Sikhi as well. Anyways, um, but it's Mira that gives me the courage to continue on. Um, and Mira herself actually says, Sad Sang Kari Kari Lok Laj Koi, that when I started to do Sad Sangat, when I started to spend time with Bhagat Ravidasji, that's when I lost my honor. People called me characterless. People had a problem that I washed Bhagat Ravidasji's clothes, that I made food for him. People thought that I was completely lost, that I was completely crazy. But still, she keeps on going and she writes in her writings, um, 
Ladore, Guru Ladore, Rai Das, Guru Ladore. So she says, I finally found a Guru. I found Bhagavad Ravi Das Ji as my Guru. And um, she surrenders and it's completely, she's all in, it's 100%. Um, so that something like that is, that inspires me a lot. But I always contemplate what Bhagat Ravi Das Ji probably told Meera. And like I said, one of the fruits of Bhakti is that you become very contemplative. Vivek and Virag enter naturally. And here's one of the Shabads that I really love of Bhagat Ravi Das Ji's. The entire Shabad, all it focuses on is knowledge of absolute truth. Remember how I said one, one of the key things that a guru does is that it, they impart the knowledge of absolute truth or Brahm Gyan, Brahm Upadesh, Satya Upadesh. And this entire Shabad that I'm about to read of Bhagat Ravi Das Ji's is completely about Brahm Upadesh. It's an rag sorat, rag sorat, bani pagat ravidas ji ki. Ek oankar sat gur prasad. I'm sure you've heard this Shabbat before. Jab ham hote tab tu nahi, ab tu hi mein nahi. Anal agam jaisi lehar mein odad, jal keval jal mahi. Madhave, kya kahi hai pram aisa. Jaisa mani hai, hoye na taisa rahao. This is contemplating the reality of life. What the heck is real? So here what they say is Pram. Pram, an English translation for the word Pram. So this is what the Pabba means illusion. I always have a laugh about this. Pram and Pram. They're so close in spelling, but they mean completely the opposite thing. Brahm is absolute real, absolute reality, and Brahm with the Pabba is illusion. It means illusion, something that doesn't even exist. So be careful about that. Brahm with the Pabba is illusion, and Brahm with the Baba means Vaheguru. <laughs> right? So, Madhave kya kahi hai Brahm aisa. What can I say? The illusion is set up this way. Jesa maniye hoye na tesa. What you're actually seeing. What you're actually experiencing, it's not actually that in reality. Rahau. And then they go on to explain what they mean by this. Narpat ek singhasan soya supne paya pikhari achat raj bichrat dukh paya sogat pai hamari. Narpat ek, there was a king sitting on his throne, actually sitting on the throne, and the king falls asleep and starts to dream. And in the dream, the king becomes a beggar while still sitting on the throne. Achat Raj, the Raj, his, his kingdom is completely intact. He's still a king. Bichrat Dukhapaya, but going into a dream state and thinking that he's a beggar, he's undergoing pain. So gat pai hamari, and that is my condition as well. Me as Brahm Sarup, because the Bhagat say, Tohi Mohi Mohi Tohi Antar Kaisa. Our real Vastavik Roop, as we like to call it, is Brahm, is Vaheguru. But playing out into this world, we've forgotten who we actually are, right? Um, like Guru Teg Bahadur Sahib Ji says, Bahar Peter Eko Jano Eho Gur Gyan Batai. Jan nanak bin apa chine mitena pram ki kai apa means our true self. We've forgotten what that is. And until we re recognize that, the fact that we're actually Brahm, that we're actually Vaheguru, mitena pram ki kai, the illusion is not going to wear off. And what's the illusion? I think I'm this five, six foot person who's struggling with life, who has this problem and this problem, this is my body, this is what I look like, um, this is, you know, something, something, or something, something, sing is my name, um, these are the types of clothes I wear, this is the religion I'm from, this is, uh, this is the amount of intelligence that I have, all of these descriptors that have nothing to do with Vaheguru. In this entire dream, We've identified ourselves with that. And now we think we're in pain, we're in reality, we're sitting on the throne of Sat, Jit, Anand, complete bliss. Guru Gobind Singh Ji refers to Brahm, Vaheguru, as Sada, Satchidanand, Sarbang Pranasi. 
Our Vastavik Roop is Sat Jit Anand, complete ecstatic bliss. But in this dream, we've forgotten who we are. And now we're identifying ourselves as beggars when we're actually the kings sitting still right now upon the throne. Achat Raj Bichrat Dukhapaya Sogat Pai Hamari, that's my condition. Raj Poyang Prasang Jaise Hai Abukach Marama Janaya. So they go on, I won't do the rest of the Shabbat, but they go on to talk about Raj Poyang Prasang Jaise Hai. There's a a common um, analogy of a snake and a rope that's used heavily in Vedant scriptures. It's heavily used in uh, Kashmiri Shev scriptures, um, and it's heavily used in Gurmat as well, as you can see right here. Um, that entire, if I go into that now, it's gonna this this video is gonna become like several hours long because the actual um, sadant of the rope and snake is it's very extensive. So they talk about that as Brahmaptesh. They also talk about They talk about in an, another analogy, which is very popular in the Advait religions of the world. So Vedanta is not the only Advait religion. Gurmat is also Advait. Kashmiri Shaiv is also Advait. Sufi sects, some Sufi sects are also Advait. Advait just means non-dualistic religions. And so they heavily talk about the, the uh, Siddhant, how do I say Siddhant in English? The concept of gold being turned into jewelry and then returning to being gold. So that's talked about here. It's just one Vaheguru in different forms. Vaheguru is closer to you than your own hands, than your own eyes, than your own senses, than your own body. And than your own mind closer to, uh, to you than that. But if you're going to meet this Waheguru, it's going to happen in a very naturally ease way. Sahaj, unfortunately, the only way to describe the word Sahaj, which is a very, very heavy, heavy word, is natural ease. But the Sahaj concept is, um, it's going to take a lot of time to describe that as well. But anyways. These are the types of Shabbats, this is the type of Siddhant that Bhagat Ravidas Ji gave to Mira, and then she ended up getting enlightened. Bhagat Ravidas Ji, um, so Mira actually, she one of her bhajans, so Mira is very popular in India, um, especially in Rajasthan, especially in Gujarat. A lot of people sing her bhajans, and she has a sort of a Rajasthani touch to her dialect. A lot of um, Gurbani's Shabbats, I didn't take them out, they actually have a Rajasthani touch to them as well. For example, you know how you, uh, I said that the three names were Janabai, Mirabai, and Jhalambai, the word Bai comes up a lot in Guru Granth Sahib Ji. For example, um, uh, oh, you know that Shabbat where um, they talk about Ari Bai Gobind Nam Mat Bisare. There we go. That entire Shabbat has a Rajasthani touch to it, but there's lots of, you know, the, the, the Bani that's kind of considered mangy or a little bit difficult to pronounce. A lot of it is, has that Rajasthani touch to it. Uh, that other one, um, I love this Shabbat. Why am I forgetting it now? That Shabbat also has a little bit of that touch to it. Anyways, I wanted to read... Um, Read, this is a, a, a poem that Mirabai um, writes, and this is about her own experience. But just watch, it's it's so beautiful. Um, it's in the Rajasthani dialect, so which I can't pronounce that very that well. So if I butcher this, please forgive me. And she writes, Savaryo ghat mai re, ramayyo ghat mai. Savaryo ghat mai re, ramayyo ghat mai. Tane kathe, tane kathe. She's saying, my beloved Savariya, mere dil vich hai, is in my heart. Ramayyo ghat mai, hey, that Ram is within my heart. Tane kathe, tane kathe. O tannu kithe, o tannu kithe, right? You see the similarity in Punjabi, tane kathe, tane kathe. 
Oh, where, oh, where do it, did I search for you? Where did I search for you? Then it got to do the law, Jaudi, Kitina Kitini Kodjam at the new Kitipaya Savario Gatamai. Where did I eventually find you? Within my heart. And then she goes on to say, Birma dekya, Bishnu dekya, Birma dekya, Bishnu dekya, Deki sarosat maire, Deki sarosat maire. Savario Ghatmai. I saw Birma. I saw Brahma. So she, a lot of uh, a lot of people think that Mira has. She's talking about her previous incarnations or her experiences. She says, "I've seen Brahma." And I don't want you to get this confused with Brahm. Brahm is Nirgun Vahiguru. Brahma is. Uh, sorry, I've gotten a message. God is. God, the one is the not. Yes, I completely agree. God is completely genderless and does not is not a he or she. I think it's just, you know, I, I'm just used to speaking this way whenever you mention, but I don't want to call God it kind of feels uh, not respectful. But let's just call God they or them. Does that work? Anyways, um, Mira goes on to say, I've seen Brahma. I've seen Vishnu. I've seen... Uh, Saraswati Ma, but where did I meet Vaheguru eventually? Within myself. And this is exactly what um, Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib just talks about. Kahe reban khojan jai, sarb nevasi sada alepa, tohi sang samai. Right? And then at the very end they say, Bahar pitar eko jano eho gur gyan batai, jan nanak bin apa chine mitana pram ki kai. Apa means atma or your inner self. Or, I mean, it comes up so much. Bande khoj dil har roj na fer pareshani mahe. Ya, kat hi khojo pai in the same shabad as kahiri ban khoj and jai. Or, um, in Kirtan Sohila, we read Nej kar, nej kar, mehal pavo sukha sahaji bahar na hoi go phera. So, this continuous reference going inwards. Anyway, so then they talk about Dekhi, uh, and then Ram bhi dekhya, Lachman dekhya, Ram bhi dekhya, Lachman dekhya, Dekhi Sita Maire, Savaryo Ghat Mai. So she's saying, I've seen Ram, meaning like Ram Chandraji Ram. I've seen Lachman, who is the brother of Ram Chandraji. I've seen Sita Mai, but where did I meet Vaheguru? Within myself. Keru dekhya, Pandu dekhya, Keru dekhya, Pandu dekhya, Dekhi Taropad Maire. I've seen. So in the Mahabharat, uh, the big battle of Mahabharat, the opposing team was the Kaurvas. I think there were like 100 brothers and the Pandus were on the other side. See, so yeah, I've seen these battles play out. I've seen Kiru, I've seen Pandu, I've seen Dropati. Dropati is mentioned in Guru Granth Sahib Ji as well. I've seen them, but where did I eventually meet Vahiguru? Savaryo Ghatamai. So this was a, a poem written by Mirabai. And this entire poet, like it, it alludes to the fact that she's, in, uh, she was enlightened by meeting, um, by merging with Vaheguru within herself. So overall, I just wanted to say that Mira is one of my greatest inspirations. She, and the reason that is, is because when she went in, she didn't look back. It was just completely going forward. And if she had to face struggles from the world, then she faced those struggles, which is easier said than done. But it was Vaheguru that always came to her, to her, um, to her help. Actually, there's a people say these are common sakis about Mira that one of her favorite ways to do bhakti was she used to do kirtan a lot. She used to sing, and when she used to do sangat, there was jamars there, there were shudras there, there were low caste people that she would sing with as well. Like when she was doing kirtan, and her in-laws hated it. She, is, she belongs to the Rajput clan. How can she have these low class people coming to do Kirtan and Sangat with her? And um, one time, I think it was her brother in law who was who finally decided that he was going to come and kill Mira. And they say what ended up happening was when while Mira was um, going to, uh, while Mira was doing Kirtan, her brother in law was coming and he was stopped by Krishna. Krishan, one of the most powerful avatars out there, stood there as a bodyguard for Mira. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's Vaheguru that comes to your, to the defense. Like 
Gershon came to the defense of Draupadi, or like um, Harnakash came to the defense of, or sorry, not Harnakash, Narsing Avtar came to the defense of um, Prahlad. It's always Vaheguru in their various forms that comes to the defense of their Bhagats, because who else is going to come? Right? Harbin Koyna Chalasathat, Dina Nath Karunapak Swami Anathaki Nath, right? And uh, I actually had one more um, Sakhi, which was of Jalambai, but I think we're nearing the one hour slot. One hour, it's been 56 minutes, so I'm not sure. Should I continue sharing it? Or. Okay. You know what? We'll just we'll share it. So Jalambai was also another Rajput princess who was the disciple of Bhagat Ravidasji. But she was not as gentle as Meera. She was a little bit, she had more fight in her. And this is a very popular Sakhi. You can check it online. I mean, it's very popular in India. What ends up happening is she meets Bhagat Ravidasji in Banaras and she invites Bhagat Ravidasji to come to Chitorgarh. So Chitorgarh is a city in Rajasthan and she invites Bhagat Ravidasji to come. And what happens is she and Bhagat Ravidasji says, sorry, I'm getting a little distracted because there's nobody in my room and I'm consistently realizing that I'm talking to a virtual audience. So please forgive me. Anyways, so what happens is she invites Bhagat Ravidasji to come to Chitorka and Bhagat Ravidasji agrees. So Jalambai, she sets up this big feast and she invites all the saints and sadhus to come eat at her palace, I guess it would be. And all of these Brahmins, which are high caste priests, come as well. Bhagat Ravidasji arrives and she invites Bhagat Ravidasji in and they're all sitting down to eat. Unfortunately, the Brahmin priests say, we're not going to sit with the Jamar. Bhagat Ravidasji is an enlightened Brahmgyani. But I want you to understand this. Just because you become enlightened doesn't mean that the world can recognize you. Right? Guru Nanak Dev Ji was enlightened. And do you know what Guru Nanak Dev Ji says? They say, Koi akhe putna ko kahe, ne, ko kahe, where was that? Koi akhe putna ko kahe betala, koi akhe admi nanak betala. Guru Nanak Dev Ji themselves says, I've been called a Putna, completely crazy person. I've been called Betal, a drunk card who doesn't know which way is right. I've been even called Admi, human, by people. And I've even been called Bichara. Oh, look at him, poor Nanak, poor Nanak. He couldn't even, he couldn't even farm properly. He couldn't even run his store properly. Who's going to get married to him? He doesn't even have enough money. He's dishonoring his father. He's dishonoring his mother. Gurnanak Devji themselves says, this is what people have called me. And they say, go on to say, but I am crazy. I'm crazy in love with Vaheguru. So a lot. Of, if you ever go on the spiritual pathway and you get called crazy, you're going the right way. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, so Bhagat Ravidasji, these Brahmin priests don't recognize him. And they say, we're not going to eat if, if we're not going to eat if a Jamad eats there. And Jhana, she's not as gentle as Mita. She has fight in her. She's like, how dare you say that to my guru? And she's about to go out and completely tell all the Brahmin priests to leave, to leave the food, that they can't have this feast at her palace. And Bhagat Ravidasji stops her and says, Beti, they're still priests. They still do prachar of satya. They still connect people to Vaheguru. Oh, sadhu santen. Oh, no, 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 Don't hurt the sadhus and saints. And so she lets them because, and Bhagat Ravidasji says, if they don't want to eat with me, I'll go into a different room and I'll eat there. Can you imagine someone like Bhagat Ravidasji having to go into a completely different room having to eat there by themselves, eat the, eat there by themselves because the rest of the other priests and the sadhus don't want to eat with him. So Jhala agrees only because Bhagat Davidasji says so. And what ends up happening is that when these Brahmin priests they sit in the rows and they're about to eat their food, they look to the right and Bhagat Davidasji is sitting there. 
they look to their left and Bhagat Ravidasji is sitting there. Every single one of these priests see this happening. It's like a divine intervention type of thing. Um, and again, like I say, it's only Vaheguru that comes to the, the help of the devotees because nobody else is going to come, right? So, uh, what is it? Pagtanki Paj Tu Rakhda Aya. There's lots of Shabbat like that in Gurbani. That Abarakho Das Paat Ki Laj all this and like, there's a there's even a shabbat about how uh, kabir ji's honor is kept by um Vahiguru, but like this is going to continue on for so long so i won't i won't do that saki but she as well had the courage and the the revolution to you know consider a chamar a low caste um to be her guru which i know it's not a big deal today but the fact that she you know had that resolution so for a lot of females out there these are the things that you should keep in mind once you go in go in all you're gonna have to face a lot i'll tell you right off the a lot of, i mean there's have there have been people very close to me that actually told me oh jasmine girls can't become sons they can't become saints and i said why and they gave me a really crappy reason which i don't want to say online but you're going to meet a lot of weird people out there. Finally, I wanted to end off with just this thing that I mentioned before as well. The pathway to enlightenment is so rare that when you start on it, the rest of the world doesn't recognize you. I'm talking about even other religious people. They don't recognize the fact that you're on a, you're on the spiritual pathway. I always say that of all of the um, the saints, the Sufi saints, the Hindu saints, the Buddhist saints, the Sikh saints that have been hurt by the world, that hurting didn't come from atheists. Atheists never tortured somebody. It always came from other religious people, right? And so I just wanted to end off with the fact that Ravi Das was called crazy because, and he was considered not enlightened because he was a Jamar. Nam Devji even says in Gurbani, Ki chipe ke janma kahe ko aya. why was I made this cloth weaver? And you guys know that Shabbat uh, about Bhagat Nam Devji where they say, Jyon Jyon Nama Hargun Uchare, Bhagat Janako Dehora Pira. That's again divine intervention by Vahe Guru where they validate, no, this is my Bhagat, right? Um, Mira was put down because she was a female. How can she become enlightened? Jana was put down because she was orphaned. And I have to say, um, and Guru Nanak Dev Ji was put down, actually called Putna and Admi and Betala. And there's actually other Guru's Shabbats as well in Gurbani where they say that people think I'm crazy. People are calling me crazy. Do, do you guys know that Pai Kanheya Ji, who was the one that gave water to the Mughal soldiers and the Hindu soldiers and the, the Sikh soldiers in the battlefield. Do you know who validated Pai Kanhaya Ji? All of the Sikh soldiers call, started calling him crazy and stupid and bad and a, a, a traitor to the Sikh, the Sikh army. Do you know who validated him? It was Guru Gobind Singh Ji that validated him because the enlightened beings, they work so differently from the, the average human being. So and at the end of the day, Bulle Shah says this really cool thing. He says, Sach kaha ta pamad machda, chut kaha ta bachda nahi, a bulya putte chaliye, jithe vasse anne, na koi sadi jat pachane, na koi sa numanne. Bulisha is talking about his experience after enlightenment when he tries to tell people what's real. Sach kaha ta pamad machda. People think, people want to come at me, they want to come eat me. Do you guys know that um, the Sufi the Sufi saint Rumi, he's very popular in the West. I'm sure you've heard of him. But did you know uh, Rumi's guru, whose name was Samsta Brej? Samsta Brej, just for speaking the truth, his entire skin was literally peeled off of him. He was tortured. Why? Because he told the truth of the enlightenment process. Anyways, the end goal here is that be courageous in your spiritual journeys. And the other thing is, lose judgment. We talk so much about prema bhakti in the sixth, um, 
in the Sikh, uh, in Sikhi. We always talk about do prema bhakti, do the devotion of love. It's the highest type of devotion. But when we actually go out into the groundwork, we see that there's not a lot of prem happening. There's not a lot of prema bhakti happening. Guru Gobind Singh Ji says it. Saach kahon sun leho sabay jin prem kiyo tin hi prabhapayo. How many times is prema bhakti mentioned in all of Guru Granth Sahib Ji and in all of the six scriptures? It's 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 there so much that I feel like we're desensitized to it. It goes in through one ear and then it comes out the other. But when it actually comes out to going out into the world, there is so much judgment. One thing I always say is, if you want to meet Vyapak Vaheguru, right? Because in Guru Granth Sahib Ji, it says, Ek Anek Vyapak Purak. Vyapak means everywhere. Vaheguru doesn't discriminate. Vaheguru isn't only inside the Sikhs or only inside the Hindus or only inside the Christians. And Bahaguru isn't only inside the beings on planet Earth. Can you imagine? There's so many faiths on planet Earth and we fight amongst each other. And there's imagine how many other planets there are in all of their own faiths that fight against each other. Ugh, it's never going to end. The point is, if you want to meet Vyapak Vahiguru, you have to become Vyapak as well. You have to shed your judgments as well. If you live inside of a small bubble to think that this is the only way, and this is the absolute only way. Everybody outside of this bubble, they're doing it wrong. They're incorrect. Oh, they're never going to get it. They're never going to get to the top. That type of thinking is very, very what we call corrosive. Judgment in general is very corrosive. And it burns up the very thing that you need in bhakti, which is a loving heart, which is a heart that is open to everybody, a heart that is willing to understand. So I just wanted to end off with the fact that lose your judgments. Become a little bit more gentle. It's okay if somebody else does it a different way. Gurnanik Dev Ji sums up, say, Kathna Kathina Aave Kot Kath Kath Kathi Koti Kot Kot. Kathna Kathina Aave Tot Kath Kath Kathi Koti Kot Kot. Aap Apni Buddha Hai Jethi Barnat Pin Pin Tohi Tethi. How many different ways has have different people explained Vaheguru in so many different ways. Guru Gobind Singh talks about it in Chaupai Sahib. I mean, it's all throughout Guru Gan Sahib Ji. So in this time, in this day and age, we need to become more kind and we need to kind of lose our judgments, step outside of our bubbles and be more gentle, be more loving. And um, yeah, that's all I wanted to end off with. Uh, yeah, I think that's it for today. Please forgive me if I offended anyone, if I said anything wrong, please forgive me um, uh, and bless me so that I can continue on my spiritual path. Um, and I hope you found this to be good. I'm very bad with conclusions. Anyways, that's the end of the video, the live. And um, thank you to SickNet for giving me this opportunity. And I'll see you guys later. Why did you get Wahiguru ji ki fateh.